The Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by these great sponsors. Are you looking to value your equipment more accurately? Target the right buyers and close more deals? Reach your ideal customer? Then look no further. Fusible isn't just about ag data. It's about action. Our best-in-class solution empowers you to value your equipment accurately, make informed decisions, and find the perfect prospects. Ignite your dealership's growth at fusible.com slash moving iron dash podcast. Out in the field, every decision counts. You wouldn't plant without testing your soil, so why would you prospect blind? Introducing EDA, your one-stop shop for ag equipment intel. EDA goes beyond specs and prices. You get deep dive data on every piece of equipment like UCC filings that help track ownership changes and uncover potential sales leads. D&B firmographics, which help you understand the financial health and buying power of potential customers. Market trends that help you stay ahead of the curve and insights on equipment demands and pricings. With EDA, you're not just looking at data, you're seeing opportunity. You find the right buyer, sell smarter, and build lasting relationships. Visit edadata.com for your free demo and unlock the power of knowledge. For over 80 years, Iron Solutions has been your go-to data source for ag dealers, lenders, and manufacturers. Get powerful appraisal and value forecasting tools that fuel profitable decisions anytime, anywhere. Get your free demo at ironsolutions.com. Iron Solutions, confidence in every click. Today, there are many ways to finance ag equipment. But nobody delivers simple, fast, or flexible financing like AgDirect. Learn more about your options to buy, lease, and refinance equipment at agdirect.com. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 for all your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. When you partner with Axon, you immediately gain access to a full range of products and solutions designed to meet the complex needs of today's grower. We carry all major brands and sizes of tires and wheels. We specialize in large diameter wheels for large equipment. We have one of the largest OEM replacement wheel inventories in North America. Known for extreme flotation setups, duals, and triples, we have wheels for all makes and models of tractors, sprayers, combines, and grain carts. If we don't have the wheel in stock, we'll custom build, sandblast, and paint in-house. There isn't a more vast inventory in North America dedicated to helping dealers move more iron. With facilities on the West Coast and in the heart of the Midwest, leverage our 230,000 square feet of indoor inventory to solve any problem a grower may have. Move more iron with Axon. Moving iron in the 21st century. Hardworking people working hard for you and me. Moving iron time and time again. Through the years you'll find us here. Podcast markets with Sean Hackett. Sean Hackett is with Hackett Financial out of Boca Raton, Florida. He's nice enough to talk about what's going on in the world of commodities. Sean, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing good from New York City. New York City. Right on. What was that El Paso? was that salsa commercial that had that? That was a uh, New York City. El Paso. El Paso salsa. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Right on. All right. More important things to talk about though than salsa. So Sean, how you uh How'd you how'd you guys fare in your neck of the woods when the hurricane came through? Well, I would say I mean uh, South Palm Beach County, where I live, came out fantastic, came out great. North Palm Beach County, very surprisingly active uh, series of tornadoes came through and did a lot of damage that was not expected. Um, and even in uh, Martin County, which is the county above in Saint Saint Lucie County. Um, a lot of tornadoes. So I think the damage was less where it hit in Tampa and Sarasota than it was supposed to be. But the damage on the other side of the state because of the, of this very unusual tornadic activity, I think was probably worse than it was expected to be. But overall, overall um, it seemed like the storm significantly weakened just as it was approaching. 
Um, and it did, it did, uh, track South of Tampa of the Bay of Tampa. And that really minimized some of the catastrophic surge that could have happened. Um, you know, had it gone a little further North. So, you know, not that it was a desirable situation, but if you had to dial it in, it definitely came in. Uh, it definitely could have been considerably worse than it was, although it was still really bad. Yeah. So, okay. Well, I mean, I think the first thing to talk about since where that hurricane came through is the kind of the core of, of uh, orange production in, in Florida, I guess. Talk a little bit about some of the reports you're hearing about that now and, and some of the yeah. ramifications that might be coming from this. It looks to me like half production was in what I call in, in the in the bullseye. The other half, not so much. Um, obviously, the way the market reacted yesterday, the market uh, reaction was that the damage, although still to be determined, they believe is less than they ha- had priced into OJ prior to the storm. Meaning, though, that uh, the storm, like I said, it, it didn't seem to pack the kind of winds that many thought. And it didn't seem to pack as much rain as many thought. And so even though there's considerable damage to the, to the orange groves that produce the orange juice, the market feels that it was less than they were anticipating. So they sold the market off short term. People are going to be going out in the field the next two to three weeks. I'm going to be watching Alico, which is a publicly traded company, the largest orange juice producer in, in Florida, for any updates that gives an indication whether the market's got that assessment correct. Or is there actually more damage and maybe the OJ market has to have a secondary rally higher? Um, I think the orange groves will be okay. Um, I don't think it was anything close to what happened last year. You know, we had the almost the entire growing area underwater with, with that amazing, incredible flooding. We just didn't have that kind of situation. Um I'm more interested in the fruit drop, Casey. That's what I'd be more interested in, in learning how much did we lose from the fruit dropping? Uh, Cause I think that's probably where you're going to lose more supply than, than damage to the trees. I think the trees will, are going to hold up pretty well, but the fruit drop, you know, that the only way you can know that is, you, is, is just to do an assessment, you know? Yep. Yep. And a lot of that assessments will be done over the next couple of weeks, especially across the, uh, across the old spectrum of the state. Follow Alico's, um, a website, a public trade company, they have to divulge all, all things that they find. I think that's going to be a good source of uh, information on what actually happened. So, okay. All right. Good source there. Alico, check that out. All right. Um, let's jump over and talk a little bit about what's happened in the corn market. The corn market has been, um, we saw a, a good run up last week. You know, we got into the, into the four thirties a little bit. Um, kind of chipped its way back down now. I think yesterday it closed at 420 or something like that. But we're seeing this activity now where we lose a couple cents, gain a couple cents, lose a couple cents, gain a couple cents. Um, we're seeing that volatility back there. I will see some harvest pressure. Sean, as you look at the situation we see right now, especially that in soybeans as well, um, as you look at the situation right now, what are your thoughts? Well, right now the, the corn market is, is, a, is a ship at sea without a rudder. It doesn't have weather catalyst like soybeans – have down in Brazil. Um, it doesn't have a weather catalyst like wheat does with Russia, Ukraine, and even here in the U.S. with dry weather during planting. So, so corn is uh, strictly being driven by what those markets do. Does it follow wheat? Does it follow soybeans? Does it follow both? And it's and it's taking its cues from demand, which has been very very good. But the problem is that you know. Demand's good. You get a little bit of a run up, then soybeans fall, and then it falls soybeans down, then wheat falls, it falls wheat down, but then wheat rallies and it follows wheat. So it's right now, it's just, it's following. It doesn't have the, it, I don't believe corn has the ability to lead at right now at this time of the year. So um, you really need to follow wheat and soybean trends in order to really get a handle on what's going to happen with corn until corn gets into a situation where it has its own catalyst to go higher. The other thing that I will say is that this Arizona-type dry weather in the Midwest that we've been seeing that has created 75% drought conditions in – I mean, uh, drought in 75% of the U.S., up from 23% in June. Um, crops are drying down super, super fast. They are, real fast. And, yeah. um, and we're starting to push below 15% moisture on corn. 
And shoot, on soybeans, I'm hearing a lot of reports of you know five percent or less moisture on massive dry down. When you dry down that fast and you harvest and and you can't get it harvested fast enough, the more you dry down below those key levels, then you get um, shrinkage and you lose test weight and you lose yield. So the USA is not going to figure that out in this report. I, you know, I'm just not. That's not something they're going to. But it will be something they help. They have to figure in later in the year. But I mean, I think that the rapid, incredible drying down uh, and and the inability to get the crop harvest before it goes below ideal um, uh, moisture moisture levels is going to we're going to lose yield on that. We're going to lose test weight on that, um, and we're going to lose some quality on that. And so that's a that's a, that's something that is an underlying bullish theme. Not that we're going to get that in today's report, but I do believe we're going to lose bushels. Usually, the USDA will start get around to figuring this kind of thing up probably in January. If I had to guess, Casey, yeah. all of a sudden they'll go boom, and then Mark will go, "Oh my gosh, what happened?" You know. But keep it in the back of your mind. Most areas now are starting to push the push through those moisture thresholds, and it's not ideal. Yeah. Okay. So, so we do have a report coming out. Uh, we have a USDA report coming out here uh, at noon today. Historically speaking, what would you expect to see from this this report? Well, it's the first report where they're not making a wild guess. They're incorporating some agronomic information from the field. Obviously, um, you know it's still early for them, and they don't have even you know I don't I don't remember exactly where the cutoff date is for them. It's probably a week ago. So uh, you know it's still early, but I think that what they're going to say is the corn number, the corn yields are about right. I think they'll juggle all these other numbers because remember we got lower old crop stocks in the quarterly grain stocks report than we thought. I still think they're going to probably lower corn ending stocks, but I don't think they're going to mess with the yield much. I think they're just going to keep it where it's at. And I think that's probably about right for now, forgetting the the, the, the drying down issue, which I absolutely don't believe they're going to, to react to. Soybeans, on the other hand, I believe there's enough information from early harvest that They've overestimated the yield on soybeans, and they need to start working their way down. And that has not—that's nothing to do with the moisture issue. That's just—I I think you know it was too wet in areas, it was too hot and dry in, in areas, and, and I think it's just we're not seeing nothing. It's not like it's catastrophic. We're just not seeing the top end on a lot of areas that we thought we were going to see. And so I think they might bring the soybean yield down in this report down. You know half a bushel to the acre, not nothing that's going to be like, you know, limit up or anything, but um, constructive, constructive to the market that, you know, small crops keep getting smaller. And so the market will say, well, if they lowered it in October, they're going to lower it again in November. And I think that's correct. So I'm, that's what I'm expecting this report, lower corn ending stocks, not because of yield, but because of, of um, uh, tightening numbers elsewhere um, and a lowering of, Soybean ending stocks because of lower yield. I think that's what I would expect in this report. And uh, what I'm looking for in the wheat market, uh, I'm, I'm really looking for them to downgrade their crop production expectations for Russia, Ukraine, for Europe, for Australia, for Argentina. I mean, their numbers are just, they're, they're high. I mean, it, none of the numbers make any sense based on the weather that we already know for a fact has taken place. Um, and 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 the, and the results that have come in on some of these places, they, they just, they just, I just, I, I'd be looking for some significant knockdowns in global wheat production, um, and then that that means that we'll get a a significant knockdown in global ending stocks. Remember, wheat's grown everywhere, so it's a global, it's the most global of all wheat markets. But I'd be looking for that as as a signpost for maybe. Um, getting this wheat market to close above $6 on the December contract. Our technical work says any weekly close, today's Friday, luckily enough, any weekly close above $6 basis the December contract would be a significant um, additional technical buy signal that um, would likely cause speculators and algorithms to um, – more rapidly buy into the market. So I would really be looking at the report, the reaction report, and can we get a close post-report above six? If we do, 
you know, then the weight market could be entering a, a, a new, a new up phase from the one that we already um, uh, had and that we've been pausing here lately. So right on. Okay. All right. Lastly, let's jump over real quick and talk about what you see happening over in, in the protein market. So there, you've seen some, some movement on the cattle side and some movement on the pork side that are in upward uh, projections. Um, you've seen some moves up higher in a time frame where you typically don't see moves up higher. It's because of the um, uh, the timing, the timeliness of where we're at right now. So I guess, Sean, as you're looking at those two markets, what do you think that that's causing that? And, and what are your overall thoughts there? I think that the aggressive monetary and fiscal policy announcements from China got the market excited in the meats, in livestock. Obviously, China demand for protein is very, very important. And I think that when they got told the world that they're pretty serious about printing and spending whatever amount of money it is to get the Chinese consumer to start consuming things again, that's very good for their need to import greater quantities of beef and pork and chicken and, you know, go down the line. Um, so I think that that was an important tailwind that we haven't had. By, we've been bearish China for, <laughs> seems like almost forever. I mean, we just haven't had that positive tailwind in a long time. And secondly, we do know the Fed lower rates at the last meeting. They're going to lower rates again. There's been a lot of debate over some of the data that's been sort of mixed and all, but they're going to, my view is they're going to continue to lower rates because in net net, you know, I, I do believe that they feel um, that the consumer needs uh, needs a little help, and the banks need a little help, especially the regional banks need a little help. And um, and and usually, you know, that that kind of a an easy monetary cycle is good for changing or improving domestic demand for proteins. So I think when you put those two things together, um, it's it's providing a, a reason why. Some speculators, you know, might be thinking that the livestock sector, you know, might be a good place to be. In the dairy, of course, it still comes down to avian flu uh, that that we're still grappling with, especially in California, and um, and the blue tongue disease over in Europe, and um, um, and so there's a lot of volatility there because we're, we're, everyone's trying to figure out. What's interesting is there's been talk and there's been. Uh, a lot of evidence that we've had a significant knockdown in supply, but yet the USDA in the August report said production was still up a little bit. Um, and that's, you know, so if, if, if we've had this catastrophic supply shock with avian flu and if the USDA is correct, that that still means we've, we're growing production a little bit. You know, that's kind of a scary thought because what, what kind of production would we have if we didn't have avian flu, I don't know. I mean, I just, it's surprising. You would have thought we'd have negative production in August, given all that has happened. And we didn't see that. In fact, components, uh, protein components and butterfat components were up considerably more. And so, and if we're, so, so the milk market's got to figure out is the USDA just behind the times or, you know, or, 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 or is the U S producer just finding ways to produce milk, um, in those healthy cows that's offsetting the cows that get sick right now, it's obviously concerning that um, we're seeing the USDA say we're not getting that reaction. And the, and the milk market did have kind of a nasty little spill here this past uh, week as a result. So my recommendation to those producing milk, you know, as I sir, I think I'd want to get buttoned up on first quarter pricing. I'd want to make sure that I didn't let those prices get away from me. They're profitable. Um, whether you want to do it with the DRP program that the government offers, that's a subsidized uh, price protection program, or you actually want to make some cash sales. Um, I just don't want to mess around with the first quarter milk. I think uh, I think given what we've been seeing here lately, that's probably something they need to do and, and keep bringing more money home on the farm. That's That would be my recommendation for those in dairy. Right on. Well, Sean, appreciate you being on the podcast. Folks want to reach out to you, get more information about what you're doing over at Hack Financial. What's the best way to do that? Our Twitter page is at Faradex11. Our website is Hackett, H-A-C-K-E-T-T, advisors.com. From time to time, we do put information and videos and interviews up there that go over our cycle statistics and correlations to see if how we look at the ag markets might be of value to those that watch and listen to your show. 
Right on. Sean, thanks for taking the time to be on. All my thoughts and prayers go out to all the folks that have been hit by these last two hurricanes, especially in Florida and up in um, uh, the North Carolina, Georgia area, um, South Carolina area. It's been uh, devastating storms, a pair of storms that have came through there. So thoughts and prayers go out to all those folks, and uh, we'll get through this like we always do. And my uh, best goes out to those folks. So, Sean, appreciate you being on. We'll catch you again next week. Casey, appreciate it. Right on. I'm Casey Seymour with Moving Iron Podcast. Check me out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Moving Iron LLC. Go to LinkedIn at Moving Iron Podcast. Check us out over on uh, the YouTube channel, which is the Moving Iron Podcast YouTube channel. And go to MovingIronLLC.com for everything Moving Iron related. So with that, I'm Casey Seymour with Sean Hackett. Let's go move some iron, folks. Out. The Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by these great sponsors. Are you looking to value your equipment more accurately? Target the right buyers and close more deals? Reach your ideal customer? then look no further. Fusible isn't just about ag data, it's about action. Our best-in-class solution empowers you to value your equipment accurately, make informed decisions, and find the perfect prospects. Ignite your dealership's growth at fusible.com slash moving iron dash podcast. Out in the field, every decision counts. You wouldn't plant without testing your soil, so why would you prospect blind? Introducing EDA, your one-stop shop for ag equipment intel. EDA goes beyond specs and prices. You get deep dive data on every piece of equipment like UCC filings that help track ownership changes and uncover potential sales leads. D&B firmographics, which help you understand the financial health and buying power of potential customers. Market trends that help you stay ahead of the curve and insights on equipment demands and pricings. With EDA, you're not just looking at data, you're seeing opportunity. You find the right buyer, sell smarter, and build lasting relationships. Visit edadata.com for your free demo and unlock the power of knowledge. For over 80 years, Iron Solutions has been your go-to data source for ag dealers, lenders, and manufacturers. Get powerful appraisal and value forecasting tools that fuel profitable decisions anytime, anywhere. Get your free demo at ironsolutions.com. Iron Solutions, confidence in every click. Today, there are many ways to finance ag equipment. But nobody delivers simple, fast, or flexible financing like AgDirect. Learn more about your options to buy, lease, and refinance equipment at agdirect.com. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 for all your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. When you partner with Axon, you immediately gain access to a full range of products and solutions designed to meet the complex needs of today's grower. We carry all major brands and sizes of tires and wheels. We specialize in large diameter wheels for large equipment. We have one of the largest OEM replacement wheel inventories in North America. Known for extreme flotation setups, duals, and triples, we have wheels for all makes and models of tractors, sprayers, combines, and grain carts. If we don't have the wheel in stock, we'll custom build, sandblast, and paint in-house. There isn't a more vast inventory in North America dedicated to helping dealers move more iron. With facilities on the West Coast and in the heart of the Midwest, leverage our 230,000 square feet of indoor inventory to solve any problem a grower may have. Move more iron with Axon. Moving iron in the 21st century. Hardworking people working hard for you and me. Moving iron time and time again. Through the years you'll find us here. Moving on